not enough to do justice to this topic, but luckily, of course, uh, you've got the whole day, so I really only have to give an introduction to um, this whole concept. And my title has been chosen basically because I know there's a wide spectrum of expertise here and, prof and professions. There are plenty of scientists here, of course, people I've known for many, many years. Um, there are also plenty of investors, and also a number of people who are involved in one way or another in policy making, policy advising, and so on. And I believe that now is the time when those of us who have not only been pursuing the scientific side of this, but also have been prominent advocates in this area, need to start really focusing on dialogue with the policy side of things. Essentially because the policy people are really behind the curve in terms of their understanding of what's coming and their um, willingness to anticipate and to prepare for what's coming. So, um, oh, that's the same slide. There you go. Um, um, so, when I started in this field 25 years ago, as Anthony said, um, a number of things surprised and shocked me. The first thing was that there was genuine disagreement, even in the field, with regard to the definition of ageing. You know, people would actually argue about what ageing is. Experts. And I thought, you know, I mean, we've had ageing since the dawn of civilization. It's been quite a preoccupation for the whole of humanity. You would have kind of thought we would have figured out an agreed definition of it. But no. Um, but that's not really true anymore. Um, the, uh, uh, people would use, different experts would use different words to describe ageing. But there's not really very much in the way of actual disputes. Um, no, the definition I'm going to give you I don't think is controversial anymore. And here it is. And this definition has two purposes. The first one is that, obviously, I want everyone to be on the same page. I want us all to understand what we're talking about. And the other one is that this is a way of demystifying ageing, of helping you to understand that ageing is not some weird kind of enigma that we totally don't understand. Ageing is simply, as I'm showing you here, the combination of two processes. First of all, on the left, there's a lifelong process. I really mean lifelong, starting before we're born whereby our metabolism, which is to say the network of processes that keeps us alive from one day to the next, um, generates changes to the structure and composition of the body at the molecular level and the cellular level. And these changes accumulate over time. Now, the reason it's appropriate to use the word damage to denote those changes is because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of those changes without significant decline in function, but only a certain amount. So eventually that amount is exceeded and you start getting the pathologies of late life. That's the right-hand process here. All right, so far, so good. Now, what can we do about this? The goal, of course, is to separate metabolism from pathology. In other words, to allow people to be alive arbitrarily long, you know, to actually perform metabolism, in other words, keep going, um, without getting sick. That's the purpose. And looking at this little picture, this little definition, you might say, well, OK, there's two ways to go about that. You could somehow separate damage from pathology. In other words, let people stay healthy even though they are accumulating damage. Or you could separate metabolism from damage. In other words, you could somehow stop metabolism from generating these changes in the first place. Either of those things would work in principle. Turns out, however, that they are both completely impractical. The um, reason why the separation of damage from pathology is impractical, you don't, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide, don't worry, um, uh, is that an awful lot of things go wrong with us late in life. And they go wrong at more or less the same time, so they exacerbate each other, they interact. Um, and plus also, of course, since the damage is accumulating, anything that tries to address the consequences of damage, the pathologies, is bound to get pro progressively less effective as people get older. Um, so that's bad. This is possibly even worse. Metabolism is also vicious. Um, this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how the body actually works, how metabolism works. And anyone here who writes software or ever has will probably immediately see that this is the ultimate nightmare of uncommented spaghetti code. So, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, uh, but luckily, there is a third way to separate metabolism from pathology, and that is not to break either of these two component processes that make up aging, but rather to separate the processes from each other. So the maintenance approach consists of damage repair. It says, let's let damage be generated by metabolism at the natural rate, so we don't have to interfere with it, we don't really have to understand it very well. 
but then let's periodically repair some of the damage so that it doesn't accumulate to the level that's pathogenic. And this has turned out to be a rather useful way of thinking about aging. In fact, it still strikes me as quite paradoxical that nobody really propounded this until I came along nearly 20 years ago and started talking about it. Because actually, when you drill down and you ask, well, OK, what would this actually mean in practice? It turns out to be rather easy to describe it. On the left-hand side here, I have a number of categories of ageing, just seven categories. And um, actually, Nir and I were talking yesterday after my talk at Master Investor, and he mentioned how gratifying it was that this list has not changed to speak of for the past 20 years. Um, and in fact, actually, one can make a stronger statement. All of the things on the left here were major categories of research interest within gerontology 20 years before that, in uh, uh, the early 80s or, or not much, um, or even earlier. Uh, so, so this is really good news. And what's even better news is the right-hand side of the table, the fact that for each of these categories, even though each category is quite a, a, big, uh, you know, a big category with lots of examples within it, for each category we can actually describe a generic therapy that actually would implement this damage repair I'm talking about. Some of these therapies are much further along than others. We've done very little in the, um, uh, on category number one at Sense Research Foundation over the years, simply because so many other people are also working on stem cells, which is essentially the way that you repair the loss of cells. Um, the other categories we have worked on quite a lot because they were being far too neglected when we started out in this area. Um, but it's all been going really rather well. And this is now really an accepted paradigm within the field. So here is a paper that came out um, six years ago. And it's basically a complete restatement of the same idea. They've divided aging into nine categories instead of seven, but that's just a different way of doing the classification. It's not that they identified things that I'd overlooked. And as you can see, this paper has been rather popular. In fact, it's going to be, by a long distance, the most highly cited paper in the whole of the biology of aging this decade. So, you know, this is now a very agreed mainstream orthodox way of looking at not only the definition of aging, but also the way in which we might want to intervene. We at Sense Research Foundation have done quite a lot in this space. This is just a small selection of the papers that we've published over the e recent years that have really um, you know, got things going in areas of research that had previously spent a decade or even two decades in relative stasis, so we're very proud of all that. Um, and a big thing is that the language is getting more, if you like, um, more honest. I, I, I've, one of the other things that shocked me when I got into this field 20 odd years ago was the repulsive degree of political correctness that, uh, that pervaded it. Um, and 15 years ago, I was asked to take over the editorship of an academic journal, which was then called the Journal of Anti-Aging Medicine. It wasn't a very good title. Um, and I changed the name to Rejuvenation Research. For um, the past 15 years, uh, that word, most of that, for most of that time, that word has been a problem, actually. Rejuvenation has been uh, too strongly associated with cosmetics and you know, plastic surgery and so on. Um, and I actually had to fight quite hard over the years to keep the journal with that name. But I, I did fight because I felt like it's the right word. We are talking about re restoring people to a younger biological age than they had before we did the therapy. And now that battle is completely won. So everything I'm showing you on this slide is um, some, uh, our developments over the past couple of years. The first two things are companies that have been founded by extremely prestigious people, um, uh, scientists from uh, Harvard and Stanford. The next one is a conference series. There's been two of them so far in Europe, sponsored by Nature, um, just like the dinner that happened last night. Again, using the word rejuvenation as what it really means. Uh, I'm just mentioning a, a very, a very um, prominent review that was written this past year by another very prominent scientist at Stanford, Anne Brunet, uh, also, again, using this word this way. So, you know, we're getting to a point where people are beginning to be brave enough to tell it like it is. And I think that's a very good thing. Now, one of the reasons we're here today, in fact, the main reason we're here today, is the emergence of the private sector involvement in this field, which, of course, is completely transformative. Um, people like Jim have 
been able to make this a respectable field. Uh, you know, Jim does an enormous amount of work in um, educating and addressing other investors, which some people would think is paradoxical. You know, he's creating his own competition. But Jim, of course, is very smart and knows that when a sector is just emerging, uh, the more people come into it, the more everyone benefits. So this is just a half a dozen companies that we've spun out from our foundation. The foundation itself is a non-profit. Uh, but that's just a small, tiny subset of what's been happening. This is a slide that I have stopped trying to update. This is probably a year old um, because it's just not possible for me to keep up anymore. Things are growing just too exponentially. If you want to know, uh, uh, if you want to have a reasonably thorough survey of the companies that are now coming along, the startups that are focused on one or another form of damage repair, then write down that URL at the bottom, which is a page that was generated as a kind of public service very recently by one of the more active investors in this field, so that's extremely important. Um, but yet, we've got a problem. What I've said so far is that the scientific community has more or less coalesced around an agreed way forward in this space. Of course, I'm not, covering, I'm not pretending to cover what the gerontology community is doing um, in any kind of comprehensive way. There's plenty of other things going on, but the general idea that damage repair is the way to go is the kind of, you know, it's the ultimate thing that's going to dominate the eventual true medical control of aging. That is now a, not a controversial concept. And that fact has pervaded now the, uh, the braver, the more courageous early stage investor community that, um, as I say, Jim has. Um, uh, made an enormous contribution to coalescing, so that now when scientists talk to investors, we, no, there's, no, there's no need to be, there's, no, there's no, not even any perception of a need to be all that politically correct. You know, you can just talk about this as what it is, medical research that will lead to medicine, that will keep people healthy, just like any other medicine. And that is something that you, you just couldn't do even 10 years ago. But here's the problem. As of today, it's restrict what I've just said is restricted to the private sector, to the investment community. The majority of my colleagues in the biology of aging, as I see it anyway, still feel the need to be very careful with their language when they speak to policymakers, politicians and such like. And you know, that kind of isn't surprising because those people have the purse strings of a lot of money that, these, uh, that we as a research community rely on. A huge part of why I've been able to tell it like it is for so long is because unlike basically any other prominent person in the field, I get my funding entirely from philanthropy rather than peer-reviewed grant applications. Um, but yes, yeah, so the thing is, the people who essentially pull the strings within government and who determine the priorities um, for academic funding and so on, these people have a big, big handicap, which is they get elected by the public. And the public are still in a critical degree of denial about all of this. The overwhelming majority of the, man in, of the men in the street and the women in the street still are clinging to the old-fashioned idea that aging is somehow separate from diseases and it's natural and universal and inevitable and there's nothing we're ever going to be able to do about it and implicitly it's kind of even off limits to medicine and we just shouldn't be thinking this way. That's really got to change, and obviously I've been working very hard to try to change that, but it's, you know, it's a really hard thing to change. And for as long as the public overwhelmingly think that way, of course, people whose predominant motivation is to get re-elected are not going to want to hear the kind of things that I tend to say. But eventually that's going to change. People are going to stop making up these bizarrely irrational excuses to try to pretend that ageing is a blessing in disguise, the way that I'm listing here. Um, they're going to understand that actually, hello, this is actually all about health, boys and girls, and that any longevity benefits, which are the focus of the sensationalist media and so on, are just a side effect of health. It's like a kind of, it's a dam that's going to break. It's going to break very suddenly when it does. The fact that we don't work on longevity, 
that we actually just work on health and that longevity is a side effect is something that's going to get through to the general public fairly soon. And we, of course we think it's a good side effect. People who are healthy, you know, they want to live longer, irrespective of how long ago they were born, and that's fine. Now, the magnitude of this um, side effect is fairly dramatic. I won't go into the details here, but suffice to say that because these therapies are true rejuvenation therapies, they will allow us to be, um, well, to, they, they will buy us time to improve them and to create better and better versions of them over time, so as to essentially stay one step ahead of the aging problem, and this will lead to very long lifespans. Um, but here's the point. We don't know at this point how long it's going to be before these therapies actually arrive in a truly comprehensive, effective form for humans. And because we don't know, we can't pretend that we do know. We can't go to policymakers and politicians and say, yes, 17 years from now, we will exactly on, on you know, November the 31st, first of, oh, there isn't a November the 31st, is there? Um, um, uh, 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 on this particular date in, you know, 2036, we will have these therapies. There's a huge amount of speculation in any estimate that any expert must make about any pioneering technology, and this is pioneering technology. But that's not why it's so important that policymakers and politicians and um, other decision makers in society need to be thinking about this now. It's fair enough to say, well, okay, you know, if it's at least a decade away, probably two, then, you know, I'll worry about it when it happens. But the thing is that what society runs on is not reality. What society runs on is expectation of future reality. That's what influences people's choices of how they spend money. And how long someone expects to live is a huge contributor, a huge determinant of how they, what kind of things they want to buy, what kind of life insurance they want, what kind of health insurance, what kind of in, uh, um, pension plan, inheritance, and so on. Now, the video you just saw from Bar Barclays, you know, that's, that's better than nothing. It's a hell of a lot better than things used to be very recently. But the fact is, if you think about what was set up there, it was still extraordinarily short-sighted. You know, the idea that we have to work longer completely ignores the fact that simultaneously with all of this advance in longevity, we're also going to have advances in automation, which are going to reduce the amount that we need people to work. You know, these things just are not being thought about in a grown-up way yet by almost anybody, and that is really tough. And what is really scary is that this change in expectation that the public is going to undergo in terms of how long they're going to live is going to happen very soon, I believe. It's going to be triggered by relatively modest advances further, relative to where we already are in controlling aging in the laboratory, in, in model organisms like mice. Eventually, you know, quite soon, I believe, my colleagues who are um, uh, experts in the biology of ageing and who have this handicap I mentioned of being funded by the government will get to the point of feeling that, nevertheless, it is safe to actually go on camera and, you know, say, yes, it's only a matter of time before we bring ageing under comprehensive medical control. When that happens, everything's going to change very quickly indeed. People are no longer going to be able to maintain this denial that I've talked about. They're going to go in a very, very short amount of time, like a week, from thinking that they're going to live only a few years longer than their parents did to believing that they're going to live a very, very long time indeed. And that change is going to mean an enormous dislocation in society and in the way the economy works. So the people who have to rebuild the economy from the ground up in relation to this new reality had damn well better have thought about it a bit ahead of that time, which means they damn well better start thinking about it now. And that's why I have focused on it today. Thank you very much.